Yeah. Welcome to Ray's Reflection, the Common Man's Bible Study. We are now moving into Chapter 4, and how this is a, one of the, the last of the four series, or the last of the four questions. If you remember, yeah, question number uh, one was, Who am I? And that was in, found in Chapter 1. And obviously the answer was, I am the Creator, the Messiah, and the Savior. And then the second question was, what do I do? And the answer is found in chapter 2, and obviously the changing of water into wine, which is a, an analogy of changing sinners into saints. And then we go to the third question, which we answered the last couple of weeks, which is, how do I do it? And there we find in chapter 3, uh, being born again and, and through the work of the, of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now we come to chapter 4. In chapter 4 and asks the question or answers the question, who is it for? Now let us understand something. Chapter 4, who is it for, is really the end, the answer is the end of the question. The first part of the, the answer appeared in chapter 3. It was encapsulated in a single word called whosoever, which is found in <coughs> verse uh, chapter th uh, 316, or the famous 316 verse. <coughs> and so what John has done to answer the question, who is it for, he has taken the Jewish society, and the reason he has taken the Jewish society is because salvation is of the Jew. So he takes the best of Jewish society, which in chapter 3 he took Nicodemus. Now notice he didn't take the high priest because the high priest was too corrupt and, and too associated with the Romans. He, he chose to take Nicodemus. This is a person who was the most, the highest, the most, the best Jew you could possibly find. This is the Jew that was destined to heaven. And he took him and showed him his great need of salvation and showed him that this born-again experience was available to him. Now, in chapter 4, we are going to meet another person, another member of this Jewish spectrum, this Jewish social line. We're going to deal with, we're going to meet and deal with a woman who is immoral. She is the the outcast of the outcast. She is the lowest of the lowest. And you cannot get much lower than this woman. So we, we're going to meet her and we're going to answer the question, who is this salvation for? And you will see that no one is left out, that whosoever covers both ends of the spectrum. So let's begin chapter 4 by reading parts of this and I will stop and explain as we go along. And now, when uh, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples did, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. <clears throat> now, what happened, if you go back, if you remember the teaching, the Pharisees did not want to repent of what they were holding on to. They did not want to accept John the Baptist's preaching, nor the preaching of Jesus. And when they saw that John the Baptist and Jesus were both preaching the same thing, and that Jesus was getting more followers than John, they used it as an opportunity to drive a wedge between them. And rather than get caught up in a mess, and a, a, you know, a, 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 an, in, an infighting, that sort of thing, between disciples, Jesus decided to leave. That would take the air out of the sails of the Pharisees, and, they, and that would end uh, the division. And therefore, if you look on the map here, it says here he left and he, had, he went to Galilee. Now Galilee is way up here. Now he was in, he was in Jerusalem. Now in, if you draw a straight line straight through, you will see he'd have to go to Samaria. Now you will notice Samaria went from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan. Now the Pharisees, or the, the more religious, fanatic type person, 
would go from Jerusalem down to Jericho, go up the Jordan River and on the east on the east side of the Jordan, see, and they would travel through to the Decapolis, and then they would cross back over if they were going up to Galilee. And they would avoid going to Samaria. Now, why was it so so bad? You must remember back when the Syrian came down back in the 700s. They came down and they captured the, top, the ten tribes, the ten northern tribes, and hauled them away. Now, it was the practice of the uh, Syrians to intermingle and intermarry uh, groups of Gentiles with Jews and so on, and therefore, and then ship them back, and therefore their children and their next generations, etc., would be a mixed breed. Therefore, they would have mixed allegiance. And this would sort of guarantee that there would not be a rebellion or an uprising against Syria. So this was a, a, a way Syria thought they would secure their borders. In the meantime, those Samaritans thought themselves to be Jews, but the Jews did not want to accept, nor would the Jews allow a mixed breed, a half-breed, to come into the temple in Jerusalem and worship. So what eventually happened was the, the Samaritans decided that if we can't go down to Jerusalem if, <coughs> to worship, they are preventing us from going to Jerusalem, then we're going to build our own temple right here. And they built their own temple. And therefore, <coughs> that issue will arise here in Christ dealing with this, this, this lady. So this is where, uh, where he is. And if you, if you look, the, the places here will be named, you will see. <coughs> see, as I talk, he says, Then he comes to a, a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. In other words, Sychar. Here is Sychar here, and there is Samaria. And Samaria is the capital of Samaria, this province. This portion here that you see, that, that's the part of the coppice which goes out into the east here. Okay, And you have Mount Gerizim here, and then there's another mount not too far from here called Mount Elba. And and there the law was written, was read to the Jews once a year here. Um, so anyway, this is where Christ came, to, to Sychar. <clears throat> now Joseph well, uh, Joseph's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, mm -hmm. sat by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, if you look at it from Jewish times, the sixth hour would be noontime. But John, I think throughout most of the gospel here, I think through the gospel, is not using uh, Jewish time. He's using Roman time. So this would be just about 6 o'clock at night. So that means that Jesus was traveling, and through the heat of the day, etc., he was tired, which reveals uh, his great humanity. And uh, so he arrives at this well. <coughs> There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away onto the city to buy food. Now, if you looked at the well where this woman came, <clears throat> this well was a half a mile outside of Sychar. And uh, archaeology has shows us that there was a well already in the city. And that's why the city was built around this well. And what was difficult was to understand was, here she was coming to a well where the water was down 60 feet. In other words, you had to draw up your bucket 60 feet before you got to the water. Whereas the well in town was much, the water was much closer. So that, that's why the town of Sychar was built or was established around this well. And the woman walked a half a mile to get her water. Now the reason she, she did that was because she was an outcast. And we will see why she was an outcast. And, and so if the Samaritans were an outcast to the Jews, they were the lowest of lowest, then she was an outcast to the outcast. 
just there was no one lower in the society than her. Now, now there cometh a woman to Jesus, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Now, then said the woman to of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, who am a, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. In other words, there's no dealing. He, she was she was shocked that this man would speak to her. And here's even worse. The Jews were told by law that they could not speak in public to a woman. So a Pharisee or a rabbi could not speak in public to a woman, not even their wives. And if they spoke in public to a woman, etc., they were breaking the laws because it was, it, was, it was said in the rabbinical laws that it was better to burn the law of God than to give it to a woman. So you can see the status here. The status of women in this society was much, much lower. And it became not only low in the relationship to, to a, a man and woman type of relationship, but it became much lower when it became uh, a woman to a religious person, like, such as a rabbi. That was even lower down, down the, the scale. And then and Jesus answered this unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, now, first of all, let us understand what the gift of God is. If we look into Acts chapter 2, verse 28, you would see what the gift of God is. It says there to repent and be baptized and receive the gift of God. The gift of God is the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying here, here is the gift. If you knew the Holy Spirit, if you knew the gift that God has for you, which is the Holy Spirit, and who it is that... <clears throat> that saith thee, to thee, give me to drink, then you would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living waters. Now, obviously, when we talk about the living waters, as we are talking about eternal life. We are talking about a place where a person could get a drink, and a spiritual drink. And the woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. And obviously the well was was 60 feet to the water. From where then has thou this living water? Now, she, you, you must remember from chapter 1, we're talking about darkness. Now, she's in darkness. So when he speaks to her of spiritual truth, and he speaks to her of the gift of God, the Holy Spirit, and of living waters, in her mind, she's thinking of running water. And in order to get running water, you don't have to have tools to drop your bucket down 60 feet. The running water would be pretty much on the surface. So she said, where is it? Because it's nowhere in her environment. She's, she knows the whole area, and she, there's no running water there. So she's thinking running water. <clears throat> he said, and then she turns around and says, Are thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. In other words, this he's talking about whoever drinks from the water of this well, etc., will get thirsty again, and they will have to come back to the well, and they will have to draw the water up and have enough and drink. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. Now let's understand. He's referring to the Holy Spirit being like the living waters. And he's saying that this well of living waters is not a well as a physical well where you can go and drop your bucket. It is inside a person. Now we call this in the heart or in the spirit. And therefore, when we think of living water, etc., it is the, the water that that is used to quench the spiritual thirst that we have. Now let's understand what he's talking about. When he says this, he's, and he's talking about, shall never thirst. You have, we have water in our homes. When we get thirsty, we simply go and we quench ourselves. So this is not the kind of thirst that Jesus is talking about. The kind of thirst he's talking about is the kind of thirst where a man finds himself thirsty 
and he has no access to any water. There is no water near him. Now he is thirsty, and his, his thirst cannot be quenched until he finds the physical water. And so he's, what he's saying is, the water that he has is within us. And therefore, when we have a spiritual thirst, we just go to the Holy Spirit, and we connect, and that thirst is instantly satisfied. This is what he's talking about, <clears throat> of eternal life. He's talking about a, a well of eternal life, which would be in every person who gets saved. And I think most people will understand, especially those who are born-again believers, understand what I'm talking about. There are times when we have spiritual thirst, and that spiritual thirst does not drag on and on and on. It is immediately satisfied. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is living in us. For within us is that well that bubbles up into refreshment and spiritual refreshing. And therefore, we have that eternal life. This is what Jesus Christ is talking about. And the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. See, she still doesn't have it quite right. She wants what he's talking about, <clears throat> but she's keeping it on a, on, a, on, a, on a physical level. In other words, she wants it so that she doesn't have to physically come and draw from this well. So she thinks that this, the, the living water that Jesus is going to give her is a physical thing. So she's a little bit muddled. She's she's confusing. Uh, she's she's confusing what she's doing every day. Now we have people like this who are in, caught up in religious uh, systems, etc. So when you give them the gospel, this it, right, they still want to see how it affects. They want it, but they don't want to give up what they're already doing. <clears throat> and, and, Therefore, you, you have a problem. And Jesus says, says, go, call thy husband, and come here. In other words, if you go back to, say, she says, give me this water, her problem is this. She still holding on to that which keeps her from heaven. Now, let's go back to Nicodemus. When Nicodemus was talking to Jesus, he was still holding on to what was keeping him from heaven. He was holding on to his legal system, his religious system. He was, his, his, his goodness, and so on. Now, all of a sudden, you have this woman who doesn't have a religious system, per se, that is any good. She's not holding on to any religious system. She is holding on to something else. And therefore, in order for her to understand fully what Jesus has to say, she has to do one of the two steps that we found in being born again. If you go back to the lessons, right, <clears throat> one of the two things that are that are necessary being born again is, one, you have to repent, and the other one is you have to believe. And she hasn't repented or changed her mind about what is keeping her from heaven. So God, Jesus here, has to expose to her, to her, what is keeping her from heaven. So the first thing he does, he asks a question. He says, go and call thy husband and come here. And the woman answers and says, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast said well, thou hast no husband, and you don't have a husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, but thou, <clears throat> thou sayest thou truly. In other words, lady, you have had five husbands, and the, one, the man you're living with now is not your husband. Now the question that is not answered here, and we only surmise, is why did she have five husbands? Did all five husbands die, and therefore she kept remarrying? The answer is probably no. Maybe one or maybe two of these had died, etc. But most likely it is that they divorced her because they found something unclean in her. This woman had a reputation. And now she was living with her sixth man, and that man was not her husband, and the question comes up was, is that man single? And if he is single, how come he didn't marry her? Or is that man living with her, and that man is the a, is a husband of another woman? In other words, here she is living in an adulterous relationship. Now, she didn't tell Jesus this. Jesus told her this. Now, at this point, 
she can do one of two things. She can confess, yes, you're right, or she can turn around and deny everything. No, you're wrong. <clears throat> and she says this, the woman faces her sin. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. In other words, <clears throat> she says yes, what you have, basically what she's saying here is yes, you have said everything correct about my life. Th that is what I am. I am a sinner. I am a, an adulteress. And <clears throat> you are correct in your assumptions. Then she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Now many commentators will look at that and say, See, she's trying to change the subject and get away from the probing that Jesus is doing to her. He, she, it, it, it's causing conviction in her, and, and she's very uneasy. But that's not what she's doing. She just admitted that, yes, she was a sinner. <clears throat> and now she's saying this. Basically what she's asking Jesus is, where do I get this living water? Because she knows something. She knows, number one, she knows that in order to get herself cleansed of sin, she has to sacrifice. Now, where is she going to sacrifice? <clears throat> she says here, our fathers say that we're going to worship here in this mountain, or we're going to, for me to take care of my problem, is here in this mountain. And, in, and, and you, the Jews say, no, it's in Jerusalem. And look at the answer Jesus gives her. Woman, believe me. Here's the first step to getting saved, believe me. The hour cometh when they shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. <clears throat> you, you worship, you know not what. He says, you, don't, you, you Samaritans don't know where you're worshiping. <clears throat> we know what we worship, for the salvation is of the Jew. It goes to the Jew first. Therefore, he says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such as worship him. God is a spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit. Now, what he's saying, what he's saying is very simple. He's saying this, it's in Jerusalem that you're supposed to worship, but there's a day coming when there will not be a place on earth where you can get this eternal life, you can get this living water, you can get this gift of God, this Holy Spirit. Nowhere. It is in your human spirit. It's from the heart, is what we would call it. And if you look at the passage, you will see that when he's referring to the human spirit, the, the, spirit, the word spirit is a small s. And if when he's referring to the Holy Spirit, it is in a capital S. You notice that? And if you, he said, if you are going to accept this gift, basically, is you are going to accept it in your spirit. And you're going to connect it. And he says this, God is the spirit. Therefore, if you worship God, you must worship him in your spirit. Because basically, that is the nature of God. And therefore, you, we have to do it from our hearts. And we have to do it with sincerity because he says, and in truth, it, we must be honest. We can't just go out and lips, give it lip service and then and in our hearts not be right. We worship with our hearts or with our spirit. We are spirit also. Don't ever, don't ever forget that you are also a spirit. You are made in the image of God, and part of you is that spirit. And that spirit must connect with the, the Holy Spirit. Now, next week, we will dis discuss the result of this confrontation, of this, of this commitment. Jesus Christ just gives, offers her salvation. And after he gets through the muddling of, of uh, all the twisting and the, the false teaching that she has had, and lays out, she now wants eternal life. Did, will she receive it? Will she get it? How will we know? What will be the evidence? That we'll talk about next week. So until next week, I uh, wish you Godspeed from on Victory's side.